Um, the gentlewoman from New Mexico, Ms. Harrell, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, I ask unanimous consent that Senator Ron Johnson's June 7th, 2021 letter to the Department of Justice be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. I ask that the FBI respond to these questions in writing to our committee as soon as possible. Um, and I want to get right on this because I know we're under a uh, time frame. Um, Director Ray, uh, Ray, how much money and manpower is the FBI using to investigate the January 6th riot compared to the months-long riots across the U.S. at federal buildings and at uh, the White House? I'm not sure I can give you exact figures on dollars and, and headcount, but what I can tell you is that in both instances, uh, we've been conducting hundreds of investigations, conducting hundreds of arrests, and involved, uh, I think, almost every FBI field office in both. Okay. And it's been reported that uh, the facial recognition is being used to track down Capitol Hill rioters. It's the same uh, technology. Is the same technology being used against those that rioted and damaged federal property near the White House or in Portland? Uh, I know that we have used facial recognition uh, in the same way they've been, we've been using uh, in relation to January 6th in connection with some of the violence and criminal activity uh, that we saw over the summer. Sitting here right now, I can't tell you specifically whether it would have been Portland or other cities or all of the above. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to ask for those answers to be um, brought back to the, commission, to the uh, committee's attention and they can be put in writing. Without objection. Thank you. And then on the, um, Director Ray, on this, uh, the scale of violence and damage to federal property during the 2020 summer was unparalleled compared to other recent incidents um, of unrest in the U.S. Would you call the summer riots of last year a threat to our democracy? Well, certainly the, the violence over the summer was a threat to, uh, to communities all across the country uh, and to businesses and to law enforcement. Uh, whether I would call it a threat to our democracy, that I'd, I'd have to think about a little bit more, but I'm not sure I can take it that far sitting here right now. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, General Pyatt, I wanted to ask you if there were any uh, questions or accusations from my colleagues that you would like to respond to that you felt like you might not have been able to so far. Thank you, Congresswoman. I, what, I, what we wanted to make clear is that we should have been prepared. We should have had an integrated security plan. We should have had a lead federal agency. Those requests did not come in. And the time to respond to a crisis, uh, sadly, when it was occurring, we just couldn't get there in time. We just were not in position. But we learned from that. And we, as we prepared for, for the inauguration, that's indeed what we did. We had that lead federal agency. We had an integrated security plan. And we had shared indicators and warnings of in intelligence and the security plan worked. That's, that's the role of the Department of Defense. Uh, people think we may have delayed a response. We had to form a new response and we had to do it uh, while the crisis was ongoing and your lives and many lives were at danger. Great, and, and thank you. And I, I wanna thank all of you for your time today and obviously for your service to our country. And I hope for the sake of this, uh, this committee and for the American people that we represent that we can get through this and then really start addressing the issues that are more adequately important to districts such as mine on the border like my colleague Jim Jordan mentioned earlier today. I know our constituents are concerned about the inflation, the spending, um, they're worried about domestic terrorism, they're worried about our global standing, they're worried about a lot of things. So I hope for the sake of of everything good, we can get through these committee hearings and get back on track and do the work of the American people. And I yield back, Ms. Chair, thank you. Thank you so much. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20-hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist 
He was intentionally targeting white military looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black on white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals, no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that, and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focus on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, that, that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, that, where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. Yeah, yeah. And I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage up, across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it ba via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy... Is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons.
You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.